Welcome to your yoga sequencing quick start guide. In this little package, you're going to get this video, which you're watching now. Uh, you'll get yoga sequencing quick start infographic with, that, that lays out the nine steps for, for teaching or practicing yoga on your own. And also a yoga sequencing handout or worksheets that you can fill out or print off and then fill out for yourself to help you develop your classes. This is the same model that I've used to teach thousands of classes and get great feedback from all of my trainers and my teachers and from yoga teacher trainees that I've taught and also from a lot of students. My name is Ashley Hagen and I am a yoga teacher and my passion is really helping people develop their own yoga practices and classes without having to be attached to watching videos or um, having to have a teacher there telling you what to do. So to create a more intuitive yoga practice for yourself on a daily basis. Okay, so let's get started. I'm gonna be just running through these nine steps of yoga sequencing quick start, and you will see at the very top of it, if you're following along, you can look at it on your phone or wherever, you'll see this little graph, this little bell curve. And no, it's not a grading, grading sheet or an assignment. It just simply explains that in a yoga class, you start slow, you warm up gradually, you come up to a peak position, and then you come back down and just as, as slow as you warmed up, you're also going to cool down. So that's the, the energy level of a yoga class. So you should be um, towards a middle class feeling challenged, maybe a little sweat going on and uh, feeling worked. And then you come back down and you feel wonderful. So to go through those, um, there is nine steps, but there's also it's also three chunks. So you'll also notice in your handout or the worksheets that page one is warm up, page two is that middle section heat building and all of that, and page three is the cool down. So you can kind of section it into three sections to make it easy on yourself. Step one is to set up your space. If you are uh, practicing at home, this is, this is uh, advice for you to set up a space in your home that is unique to your yoga practice. So not somewhere that people are always running around, not like uh, a place where there's a lot of traffic. So somewhere in your space where you can set up maybe a, like a little yoga or meditation altar, somewhere where you can come to and feel at peace and at ease. Um, at my at my house, my little yoga space, I put little trinkets and things. Like I've got this little yoga girl. This was a gift from a friend. I've got my little panda bear. And I also put um, different like beads and things. Oh, also essential oils. So there's a, or candles, candles, essential oils. Um, you can put a lot of different things in your little yoga altar. Just having a space that feels calm and wonderful. Along with setting up your space, make sure that you set a time in your calendar that you can be most consistent. So there is no best or worst time to practice yoga or to exercise really. It's when you can be most consistent on a daily basis. So it's better for you to practice yoga for 10 to 15 minutes every day at the same time, rather than randomly for an hour and a half one week and then maybe not until two weeks later, just because you forgot or didn't have the time. So carve out 10 to 15 minutes. That's all you really, really need if you want to build a healthier and a happier, more op optimal life. Okay, so there are, all, are also a couple tips and stuff in here in this guide or in this, um, this infographic, like the goal of yoga. And later on, you'll see uh, information on Ujjayi breath, but we'll kind of skip through those as I go through the steps. So step one is setting up your space. And then we're getting into actually practicing. Step two is to pick a starting pose, one that you feel most comfortable in and that you could probably sit in for up to five minutes. Maybe you start with one or two minutes because oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll feel that pose. You're not used to sitting on the floor. You're not used to child's pose. It's hard on the hips. But pick a pose that you are able to just come to and relax and find your breath. My favorite is a simple, easy seated pose. Sitting on the floor, cross leg. If you want a pillow or a bolster, you can lift yourself up and it can be easier or better on your knees and hips. Other poses include um, standing and mountain pose. Because I practice in the morning, standing right away in the morning is a little bit like, whoa, I'm not ready for this. I, I don't wanna lay down because I'm kinda tired, I might fall asleep, but I also don't wanna just 
super just wake up. So I start seated in an upright position. Um, but mountain pose standing is a great variation. Child's pose, knees are forward, you're reaching forward, sitting on your heels and your forehead's on the floor. That's really great for getting rid of distractions, also good for hip opening. Uh, standing forward fold, that's where you're standing and you're folded forward. Great probably for an evening practice after your legs are warmed up from the day. And also lying down or supine, that's also great for an evening practice when you're looking to wind down. So think about your energy level uh, for you or if you're a teacher for the class. If you're looking to gain energy or you want to uplift students or you're looking to um, just get you know, get that energy, you wanna start upright. So start standing or seated with your body lifted. If you're looking to calm your energy, come down like an evening practice after a busy day, uh, find something like lying down or child's pose and use as many props as you need to. In this starting pose, you're also going to set up your breath. It's deep breaths down into the belly, deep belly breathing. Connect to the present moment. Um, use that circular breath pattern, so in through the nose, down the back of the body, fill the lungs from bottom to top, and then exhale out through your nose again. And then we've got, let's see, how to use the breath. Use the breath by modifying and intensifying by checking in. So if your breath gets choppy or you're like, <gasps> which you shouldn't be, it means you should probably come down a bit. The great thing about practicing as a, at home is that no one's there to judge you or watch you and you're not, you're not trying to show off to anyone. And I know you don't do that in regular yoga classes either, but if you're anything like me, I know you wanna make it good for, for some reason. You wanna make a good impression or you want to keep up with the class uh, you'll tend to push yourself a little bit more. So the purpose of this self-practice at home is to you know, push yourself, but not beyond your edge or your limit. Okay, step number three. After you've been in that, that, that initial pose for a few minutes, um, usually up to five or so, you do some simple spinal warm-ups. I say spinal warm-ups because it's moving your spine and actually heating the muscles that wrap around your spine, which is your core. And your core is much more than just your abs. You've got the sides of your body and your back. So the entire round that wraps around your spine, helping keep your spine safe and mobile can be super beneficial for all the energy and information being sent up and down the body. Your spine and your core are where it's your powerhouse of your body. It's where your movements stem from. So there's a few ways we can do simple spinal warm-ups. Moving in six directions of the spine, that the spine moves. They do side bend, side bend, so the lateral bending down the side of the body. We do forward and back, so rounding and arching, like cat and cow poses, and then twisting, so you're twisting around, wrapping around the spine. So along with those six directions, you could also do circles or shoulder movement. Uh, and it's as simple as that. So maybe if that was un not understandable, let's see. What I typically do as an example is I start seated, take a few deep breaths, check into my space, and then I'll start with side bends. Inhale, reach up, exhale, side bend. Inhale, reach up, exhale, side bend. I do that three times. Then inhale, reach up, exhale, twist. Inhale, reach up, exhale, twist. I do that three times on each side. Then I'll have my hands on my knees and round and arch. And that's that, simple spinal warm-ups. And if that was your entire home practice, five, 10 minutes, perfect. If you can do that every single day, you'll start to notice really great positive effects uh, on your breathing, on your life, on your mentality, on your body, um, just by simply moving your spine and taking deeper breaths and becoming aware. But if we're moving on to a fuller practice, we can move on to sun salutations. There are a lot of versions of sun salutations. They basically help heat up your body and in the series of a sun salutation, basically the entire practice is contained within that sequence of a sun salutation A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I really only know A and B. Uh, and those are the main ones you'll get, but there's also, um, I've done one called the Tibetan sun salutation, a sun salutation S, uh, the one I have pictured in the infographic is Sun Salutation A. So inhale, reach up, exhale, forward fold, inhale, half lift, exhale, step back to plank pose, then lower to chaturanga, inhale, up dog, 
Exhale to downward facing dog. Then step forward to forward fold. Half lift, inhale. Exhale, fold it back down. And then we rise up to standing pose, back to mountain pose. And if you did that three to five times, you're gonna heat up your legs, your body, upper body. A lot of things are gonna go on. It just feels really nice. Of course, there are weights to modify. You don't have to do the push up. You can lower to your belly, cobra pose. Uh, you can easily look for sun salutations on YouTube. I think I have even a couple on my uh, YouTube channel if you wanna see what some sun salutation ideas. Uh, so that's just a great way to build even more heat. Again, this could be where your practice ends. You do a few sun salutations, come down, sit, take a breath and go, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> um, but it, again, if we're moving on, so now we're up to about minute 15 or so of our practice, we start to do some standing poses. Standing poses are what's really gonna build heat in our bodies and get into those metabolic muscles. So yoga is not about burning calories or anything like that. But if you are um, working into a more challenging pose, you need to be able to build heat in order to stretch the muscles. The best time to stretch is after you've warmed up a lot. Best time to stretch when you run is afterwards, not before, uh, in, in case you didn't know that. So doing some like different warm ups like we're talking about, stretching after the heat building. So standing poses are what's gonna create that heat. We've got warrior poses. Crescent lunge, wide forward folds, uh, squats, yoga squats, goddess pose. These are a lot of the standing ones where your legs are involved, but you can work a lot into the arms as well. Different arm variations, hands behind the back, that kind of stuff. So doing, getting into the legs. And you'll see some examples I have here. Low lunge, and these are up to, up to five sequence, up to five poses per sequence. You don't want more than that because it can get confusing in your head and then your body also doesn't really like doing like a 30 minute sequence on one side and then having to switch to the other. So up to five, one to five poses on each side before you switch back and forth. So one would be a low lunge and then in that low lunge, then you twist. And then from there, airplane, so a low lunge, arms out. Warrior three, where you come up to a balance pose, lifting up, and then back to high lunge. Reach up, and you're in a lunge. And then come back down, switch on the other side. You can hold for as many breaths as you want in each pose. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's more flowy, more dancey, uh, or perhaps today you're like, I'm gonna hold for 10 breaths in each pose. And that can really be a challenge. We've also got warrior one, warrior two, reverse warrior, triangle then half moon into a balance that's that's a, a sequence that's super common that i see a lot i like that sequence a lot it's very simple very straightforward and then i have another example let's see warrior two side angle triangle reverse triangle and pyramid it's another one getting into the hamstrings and the legs so that's only a couple examples but you can build as many little sequences as you want and uh, it depends on you know, what, your, what muscle group you're looking to heat up or stretch. Okay, no, step number six is core exercises. I didn't actually know where to put this. It's kind of more of an optional thing. Core is not optional because throughout class you should be engaging your core all the time. But core exercises, specific core exercises can be done anytime in class. Not, it doesn't have to be after standing poses. It can be before sun salutations. It can be during sun salutations. Like you do a mountain climber or something or, or some plank work in between. Um, so really ideally you should be engaging your core the entire time. But if you're looking for an extra little burn, um, you can place, place the little sequences throughout. Boat poses, plank poses, side planks, forearm planks, um, what else is there? Uh, if you're on your back, you do little leg lifts. Uh, you can, there's a lot of different core stuff out there. And you can also pull from different modalities. So you don't have to do just yoga core exercises. You can take it from Pilates or wherever. All right, along with core though, uh, think about how your core wraps around your whole spine. So it's not just abs. You also have to work your back. So a good time to work back bends or back extensions because they're often a little bit weaker than the front of your body would be after we're more warm. So back bends, if you're getting deeper into back bends, would be a great time to do them after the standing sequences. 
Okay, so when about when you're coming down to to sit and to recover, um, because they're very also very energizing. Back bends are great for a morning practice because of that energizing factor. Okay, getting into step seven, which is our peak pose. This is actually where our class planning begins. So you're gonna pick a, a muscle group that you wanna work or a specific pose you wanna work into and then build your whole class around that. So I know I didn't mention this in the very beginning, but in your handouts and worksheets, you'll see at the very top will be peak pose or theme or intention. And so you can pick like, what is, what is it that you're working on? You might today decide you wanna get deep into hip opening and do like king pigeon pose or fire log. And so, you'll build your class and your even your starting pose will be built around your uh, main peak pose that you get into about two thirds of the way through class, halfway to two thirds of the way, because this is a big, big hurrah. Uh, so if you choose something like a back bend, let's say camel pose, throughout your class, you wanna be doing more crescent lunges, a little bit more back bending, maybe some twists to even out neutralize those back bends. So you're going to think in terms of what would help benefits or help lead me into this peak pose and also what are good counter poses or what's the opposite so that I can do both. Because typically when you're doing a counter pose, you're stretching and strengthening the opposite muscles that you're stretching and strengthening in your full pose. So peak pose is your start. After the peak pose, you wanna come down into like a counter pose. So that would be an opposite, a more relaxing restorative counter pose. Let's say if you did a deep back bend, you might wanna do a simple forward fold. Child's pose is always good. If you did a super deep twist, again, a forward fold might be really good. If you were doing something like a deep forward bend, possibly reverse plank or more of a heart opening or a twist to, to unwind. Okay, then we get down to seated and supine poses. I bunch these together because in my classes, I typically teach a very strong class and the cooling down really is uh, just a few seated poses, a few poses on my back, and then we're in Shavasana. So it, it's like the last third of class or so. In an hour class, it's usually 15 to 20 minutes to go uh, before. And so it's like 10, 10 to 15 minutes maybe seated and on our backs. So we can sit down, some good poses to do seated or any counter poses that, that help uh, enhance your, or help counteract that peak pose. Uh, a lot of people really like pigeon pose, uh, good for hip opening. Forward folds, um, twisting, seated twists. Um, yeah, so there's just a few different like seated poses you could do. More core work like boat pose if you'd like. Then you can come down to your back and I use almost the same sequence every single time that I do that I, before um, laying down in Shavasana. I'll roll down and then we do a bridge pose, so a back bend. We do an inversion like shoulder stand or legs up the wall. And then we do a single leg like spinal twist. So you're twisting from side to side by with laying on the floor. Uh, then happy baby just to get a little bit more into the hips. And then we do Shavasana, which is step nine. Uh, so step eight and nine, it's the, the ending of the class is, it's a good, it's sometimes good to keep the ending the same almost in every class as just your basic cool down. Uh, of course, adding and subtracting a couple poses here and there is not going to hurt anyone, um, but to have it basically the same can be really beneficial. And if you're a teacher, your students will know what to expect when they're coming down to the floor. Step nine, Shavasana. I usually use about 10% of my class time to just lie down. Ideally, like five to 10 minutes. Um, if you did an hour practice, that's five to six minutes of time. If you did just 30 minutes, maybe it's two to three minutes. If it was a 15 minute practice, you might just wanna sit for a minute or so and, and just to uh, unwind, relax, and absorb all your practice. Shavasana is very important. Don't skip it. It's a thing that, that connects your entire practice together. Anyway. That's the nine steps of our quick start yoga sequencing guide. I hope that was helpful. Feel free to check out the worksheet that's attached in this and um, fill it out because that was just gonna be really helpful for creating your own yoga practices at home and as a teacher. If you like this video and you like what you have here, I do dive deeper in my simple sequencing and self-care online course. So that's more of a four-week accountability group 
with me and with others, and we start every so often, monthly or so, sometime, but you'll notice the, the beginning date on the website. If you click sign up, you'll get a little bit more information on the course. And in that course, we go through um, the sequencing, same kind of, uh, same guide, but you'll get a lot more as a teacher, you'll get more cueing and teaching advice. You're going to get live lessons that help you go through each of these, and I'll break down the poses a little bit more, and you'll get more guides and PDFs and help with each step of the process. So you get a lot more stuff with it, right? Um, so again, I hope this was helpful. If this is where, uh, this is all you needed to help you on your path, that's awesome. Otherwise, I hope to see you in my next course coming soon. And also, have a super awesome day. Namaste and goodbye.